Hello there, and welcome to the Senate Podcast. My name's Caleb Johnston. I'm your host. Today, I'm joined by Andrew Tate Smith for our second episode, where we're going to talk about all things pop culture. I guess you could say it's episode number one, but episode number one is in a special place for now, and it might be uploaded sometime in the future. But for now, we're going to roll with episode number two. I'm the host, Caleb Johnston, and I'm joined today by Andrew Tate Smith. (laughs) I mean, we'll go with that, yeah. (laughs) So how are you doing? Yeah, pretty good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I am I'm very excited specifically for this episode because of just uh-huh. the time of year it is. It is what is today? November 1st? Yep, it just hit November. So of course November is the biggest month for video games. But no doubt. This year has been an insane year for video games. Absolutely. It has also been an insane year for movies and all kinds of pop culture content. Yeah, I noticed that too. And the uh, the run of the show, we got a lot of pop culture content to talk about. Okay. We got more Marvel games on the way. We're talking about PlayStation finally falling off. Mm-hmm. The downfall of acclaimed British team Rocksteady. Oof. And we're going to talk about some trailers for some upcoming movies and just the insane amount of great movies and games that have already come out this year. Yeah, I'm looking forward to just diving into this and seeing what we can get ourselves into. We're probably going to get into a lot. But before we get into any of it, like I said, the Senate podcast, it will be out on all major platforms with weekly episodic releases. However, there will be an additional podcast coming out alongside it that's more of like a live session it is going to be a you know a live stream comprised of different guests every week talking about a specific topic so not necessarily news items or you know what you've been playing or watching but specific topics those Uh will be coming out too uh hopefully weekly we're you know Starting up, seeing how it goes. If it goes well, we'll be releasing those weekly too. That's really all the news I got it. involving the podcast. So, sounds a good start off right there. Yeah, I guess. I mean, you got to start somewhere. Exactly. That's all that matters. It's all that matters. I'm gonna make you go first. So, okay. <laughs> tell me, tell me what you have been playing. Um. Well, uh, there's a couple things I've been playing recently. Uh, the big one is the new Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, uh, obviously the 2022 version. That that just came out, too, about a week ago. Yeah, recently. Um, I saw, obviously, they touch up a lot of stuff compared to the 2019 version. Um, the gunsmith features feel like it's a lot more together. The grind doesn't feel like it's as bad. They make the levels a little bit easier. And um, just a solid play. I'm really liking how it feels overall. Uh, yeah, so it's been out for a week. Um, presuming you've played it a good bit in that week. Yeah, on and off. I probably have okay. like maybe eight hours total. Okay. Are you looking forward to Warzone? Are you a Warzone person? I am on and off. I I like Warzone overall. I like the concept of it. I just feel like when they did add Warzone with the last 2019 version, they went very microtransaction heavy i mean obviously it's going to be a free game for that specific feature but i feel like it bogs down you know like oh this is the agenda that we're pushing for so we're going to start selling you know needless stuff so to speak. almost gotcha type in a way it's also more like 20 dollars for like one gun skin oh, yes it's it's the fortnite effect I feel like it's worse than that, because at least with Fortnite, yeah. you can have different like skins. You could just be like, okay, yeah, these are very basic weapons, but you could put a skin on it. Here, it's like, you want this nice gun? Well, this is the only gun you get, 20 bucks. So aside from the live service aspects, the game itself is a solid sequel, but is it a solid sequel 
just to the 2019 Modern Warfare Remastered, or is it a worthy successor of the OG MW2? Oh, I mean, OG MW2 obviously did a lot of neat things. Like it added the, I believe they added the pro perk system. So like you could put points into a pro version and upgrade that. I wouldn't really say that anything could compare to that type of customization, but what they do offer does feel like you can kind of cater yourself to a specific play style, even with a specific gun receiver, receiver, if that makes sense. That's, I think, a logical, you know next step for the series sure and i think that's kind of the direction they're going with more of a a semi-realistic approach and you can't rehash the old stuff continuously no you kind of have to kind of make a point to break free from that heritage if that makes sense you have to that's that's the only way to stay alive in in the games industry which is constantly evolving well yeah i mean don't get me wrong people like it if they see like a remaster every once in a while like if especially it's a really good one but if you see nothing but that it loses its value because it's like oh this is just going to get remastered next and oh this is next and now it's so funny we're on the topic of remasters considering all of the backlash remasters have been getting lately Mm -hmm. and it's funny because they just announced um the witcher Number one, the first Witcher game huh. is being not just remastered, it's being remade. Okay, cool. And I know, you know, remakes and remasters have been a hot topic. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, gla- sure I'm, I'm actually glad, like, Modern Warfare, they're, they're not calling it a remake or a remaster. They're just literally using the same exact name. Mm. But... It's not trying to be a clone. It's just trying to be different. That same ex- that not the same ex- experience, but to give an experience like that to a new generation of gamers. Yeah, and it's hard to describe exactly what that word is. I feel like overhaul might be an appropriate word to describe what they're trying to go for. Yeah. Taking something from the ground up and turning it into something similar but fresh. Now the question is, should they use that name? I. Th- feel like they kind of earned it because yeah, yeah. especially if you're consi- like if you're doing like the story mode in particular like if you're bringing these characters and you're doing like a more modern retail of it if you're true to the source i feel like you've earned the right to continue using the name for it even if it's not the exact same thing yeah i think they're obviously using the name to just kind of siphon off that not the entire demographic but they're siphoning off fans of of the that name you know what i mean people are going to pick this up because it is modern warfare 2 and they have such an attachment to that brand specifically you know the modern warfare brand but like you said they've earned it yeah to degree i mean i'll kind of touch on that just a little bit before we move on but I feel like it's not like Black Ops 3, Black Ops 4, where they're just hashing another number. It's just a sequel. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a sequel, a titled sequel. Yeah. Yeah, but this is actually more of like a, I guess, a revamp of what they already had, like with the 2019 version. Here, we're going to give you this stuff. And then this new version is like, well, what can we do to improve it? Let's do these things and give the people more variety. Yeah, and and we all love you know, the the franchise Call of Duty. I'm excited to hop into it. I'll be I'll be getting it soon and experiencing all this myself, but tell me a little bit about uh some of these other games you've been playing. Okay, yeah. Uh two other ones. A real big one I've been playing a lot is uh it's by Riot. Um it's called Legends of Runeterra in particular. Um it's basically like a turn based card game where you incrementally put down more powerful cards and you just try to defeat your opponent but a sub mode in particular and that's called path of champions and it's like a roguelite um card builder where as you beat enemies you get card choices and then you kind of work towards making really broken and fun stuff that aspect specifically the roguelite yeah sounds interesting to me because i've been playing marvel snap which 
is like probably more um, similar to the the main mode of that game. Yeah. But Path of Champions, like you're saying, is is the roguelite aspect, which sounds sounds interesting to mix a, a strategic card game with a, a roguelite element. Yeah, I've been an avid fan of roguelite games just because you get more out of it than what your initial playthrough would have been. And I know you have story games that offer like a very rich experience, but these games are meant to be more of like a constant replayability. So you get um, dynamic encounters for the most part as you play through them. Nice. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, definitely. Since I've been dipping, you know, my uh, my feet into the card game world yeah. a little bit. <laughs> we'll, we'll call Snap a card game in technicality. Yeah, I, I, if you want to, if you want to go as far as calling it a, a card game. I mean, it has cards. I will give it that. So by definition, it would be a card game. They're more like NFTs. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, you're not selling them, so there's that. That's the next step. That's the gotcha Uh-oh. element. <laughs> That's when you go, um, yeah, M- MFT, be Marvel Fungible Tokens. <laughs> the MFT market. Yeah. We're, Marvel, we're trademarking that. The oh, MFT. Patent this. We'll take We have good- to patent it because, you know, Marvel, they're going <laughs> to, as soon as they hear this podcast, they're going to trademark that immediately. Yeah, we want a 33% cut flat. No exceptions. They're going to run us into the ground. Absolutely. Try to take that name. All right, what's the next one? You got All one right. more. The last one, um, this actually kind of popped up about a week or two ago. It's the World of Warcraft Dragonflight pre-patch stuff. Um, I say that particular because I usually don't play as much during the main game, but I always check out the pre-patches. And one of the neat things they have is talents. And, you know, obviously they changed it in Cataclysm to be a more narrowed selection, but with the this Dragonflight pre-patch, they're kind of giving you more options, almost like you were, you know, back to, say, Wrath of the Lich King, where you could kind of branch out and choose more customizable options. That was a lot for me to take in. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can simplify it if you want me to. Go for it. Okay. Um, before, you had a lot of customization. Okay. Then they made it less customizable, and now it's more customizable again. So that's why you're jumping back into it. Yeah, because gotcha. that particular thing caught my eye, and I do have a few mixed characters here and there. I just like experimenting and seeing how the new stuff is with them. I completely understand that, because that is exactly what I'm doing with a series called Far Cry. Oh, okay. I haven't heard that name in a while. I mean, obviously, I've heard of, you know, Six, but, like, it's been a good bit since it's been out. Yes. So, my my first experience with the series was Four, actually. Wow. And I actually really enjoyed it. I got pretty far in it. Never beat a Far Cry game, but I played um, Four, and then I played Five. And I always wanted to play Primal and New Dawn. I thought the spinoffs looked awesome. Oh, yeah. I think but, I actually, I'm sorry, uh, just rented out a bit on Gamefly way back for Primal. It's not bad. Uh, yeah, I, I remember I remember those days, and that was that was always something I wanted to do was rent it or, you know, demo it or something. Because just the, the premise of it would seem yeah. so cool to me. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's kind of like Redbox where if you mess it up or exactly. you have it for so long, it's on you. But the concept of just switching out games as they come in and out gives you a little bit of freedom to yeah, uh, commit. There was a lot of these back in the day where you had, you had spinoff after spinoff mm-hmm. and you didn't want to invest all of your time and money into each spinoff. So that's why I never got into the series as much as I would have liked to. Right. And I have a lot of series like that, but what draw with, with what has drawn me back to Far Cry six specifically is the man Giancarlo Esposito. Oh, absolutely. I mean that he, if he's he is in if he's in something you have you have to consume the content. Exactly. I mean otherwise he's going to look at you with those eyes and you're just going to have your entire being disintegrated. Specifically the eyes from 
we we all know the eyes we're talking about from Far Cry Six. Mm-hmm. Yes. So the I guess the premise of Far Cry is is the rebellion against yeah. a, a dictatorship or a cult, what have yes. you. Some sort of tyranny. Yes. That is interesting because, you know, like the, the podcast, the Senate, it's an allusion to Star Wars, mm-hmm. which at its essence is a story of rebellion. Yeah. So naturally, a, a series like Far Cry is going to get my attention. But there was always an element of it missing. And I, I never knew what that was. And it was probably two things. The, the setting and the character. Right. Char- games with characters that you play as that are supposed to be an avatar of yourself and not necessarily a character within the world mm-hmm. don't usually draw me in. That's why I've, I lost interest. That's fair. And Far Cry is a very unique game because you're, the protagonist is kind of the main villain of the game. In a sense, I guess it depends on how you look at the the leader's ideology. And the way it's – what I'm thinking about is the way it's presented in the game. Because, yes, your avatar is interacting with the world, mm-hmm. but the story is driven and is focused around the villain. And, yeah, like a fixation on that villain. Yes, yeah. yeah, so even though they are the antagonist to your – avatar yeah the game as a whole they feel like the protagonist when i'm playing four cry six i'm waiting for giancarlo to pop up <laughs> yeah and when he pops up i'm not i'm not wanting to kill him but I feel i'm just like wanting the, to see what he does yeah because he is in his own category like he's not so much a villain but so much an obstacle like you don't yes. want to get rid of him you just want to get past him i want to figure this guy out yeah his motives and like I said, this setting too. Yara is extremely interesting. I probably would have loved Far Cry 3 because of the island aesthetic, but I never got into it. Yeah. Yara is similar, but it is almost fictional Cuba in a way. Okay. It is a very, very beautiful game. I wish the resolution was better. I'm not sure why. It looks like it's 1080p, but... I would not be shocked if it was actually 1080p. I was assuming it was 4K, but the resolution is messing with me. But the art and just the world, absolutely beautiful. So that is making me want to spend time in the world and and just live in that space. Yeah, very similar. Um, I used to play back in the day Just Cause 3. Okay. Yeah. It's not necessarily the same thing in terms of like story, but it does give you like this nice island like vibe and you're kind of just going through um it's almost like a sandbox type of thing that Far Cry in a way is also like that. Um I just wanted to make note like Yeah, and normally sandbox games aren't my cup of tea. Mm-hmm. But like I said, man, Gene Carlo. Yeah, of course. I mean, why wouldn't you? I know. I had to. Yeah. And I don't usually get the physical, you know, games, physical versions of the games or whatever, but I had to get the case. Yeah, I understand. I mean, yeah, you made the right choice. I did. Motive Studio developed Dead Space. Oh, okay. Yeah. Most specifically, the new Dead Space remake coming out January 27th, 2023. Yeah. Also, and more recently, they made Star Wars Squadrons, which was actually a good game. Really? Yes. I've heard mixed, um, mixed opinions on that. By good game, I just mean in terms of mechanics, fidelity, performance, all of that content wasn't there. Sure. I mean, yeah, like the fundamentals were obviously you know grounded, but... I just think they're a talented team, but EA has been pushing for certain uh, stipulations and, you know, that for their games that don't necessarily help. I mean, let these, let these developers make a single player, third person action adventure game, and it will be good. They have the talent. 
Yeah, the only problem would just be the funding. Like, that's probably the biggest one. Like, if you're going to have that dream and ambition, uh, a publisher will want a specific thing, but they're going to be able to back up, you know, that execution. Yes. So that quote was from EA, and I believe this quote is from the COO of EA saying, Mm -hmm. quote, Developed in collaboration with Marvel, the Iron Man game will feature an original narrative that taps into the rich history of the character, channeling the complexity, charisma, and creative genius of Tony Stark, and enabling players to feel what it's like to truly play as Iron Man. End quote. Okay. I, a lot of people have probably missed that quote because you actually have to go in um, on EA's website to find huh? that quote. I'm not sure if it's making the rounds on Twitter. All right. But specifically, they want to channel the complexity, charisma, creative genius of Tony Stark, enabling players to feel what it's like to truly play as Iron Man. And remember, what is the most important thing about a video game? Immersion. It's how it feels. Yeah. Exactly. How it immerses you in the experience. And you can't immerse somebody just by the fidelity, like you said immersive yeah so that raises a good question why do they feel like they have to make this game when they already did the marvel's avenger game back in 2020 and they had (laughs) different aspects you know like the tony stark mission where like he's i guess ambushed is if i'm remembering that correctly and he has like limited pieces of his armor like wasn't that immersive enough here's how i can explain that okay Avengers was made by Square Enix. Okay. Developed by Crystal Dynamic. Okay. Crystal Dynamic, very talented team. Sure. Square Enix kind of forced them to turn the game into a live service, what it was. Like you're saying, the immersive sections of the game were its narrow single player portions of the campaign. Mm -hmm. If you played it, you know what I'm talking about. It's the story segments. The story segments were immersive. However, the game was unfortunately not received well because of the life service aspects that Square Enix wanted in it. Yeah. Anyways, different publisher, different developer. And like I said, from the top Marvel is, I believe making some steps in the right direction for the video game front. Because really the only success they had in the last five years was Spider-Man PS4. Sure, and that definitely was, you know, their, like, child for a good bit. I understand, like, them trying to change it up by giving a new hero to kind of follow the same footsteps in. And Marvel has always had games. They've had Marvel Marvel vs. Capcom. Mm -hmm. They've had Ultimate Alliance. Uh Uh-huh, yeah, definitely. They've had... The, Sp- the the many Spider-Man games before Spider-Man PS4. Spider-Man PS4 was the most successful. Then they came out with Avengers, one of the biggest flops in video game history. I do have to agree. But it doesn't end there because they went on, Square Enix, to develop Guardians of the Galaxy. The Guardians of the Galaxy game was critically received very well. Commercially, it was not received very well. Okay. It's sad because there is potential for Marvel, you know, IP. And I think partnering with EA, Marvel is giving them the reins, you know, Motive Studios, to create this immersive game, enabling players to feel what it's like to truly play as Iron Man. I think Motive, I think they're talented. I think... Iron Man is a great place to start because specifically of the immersion EA to develop at least three new action adventure games. My question is, what are the other two games? Ooh, well that, if they're doing anything Marvel, we kind of have to take a look and see how diverse they want their action adventure games to be. Like, so they're starting off with a single player third-person action adventure Iron Man game, but that raises the question, do they plan on having a co-op experience? Yes. 
do they plan on, I don't know, having a different, say, like a competitive aspect? Maybe that's a thing too. I mean, it's hard to say because there's only the information of the number of games, but off the top of my head, they could, you know, do something with like Asgard, you know, say like an Asgard battle experience, make it multiplayer, like you versus a, a budding like tribe or whatever, and you're just fighting it off. That could be a possibility. With the success of God of War, specifically <laughs> the Norse mythology games, yeah, assuming Ragnarok is going to be success, which it will. I have good hopes on that, yeah. I think that's a safe bet is a Thor-themed one. Sure. I mean, it would make sense from Marvel's perspective. They see a successful Norse-based game. They have a Norse-themed uh, IP. They could definitely make it work. Here's where I think we can narrow it a little bit. They have Spider-Man. Sure. They failed with Avengers. Mm-hmm. Guardians failed. I hope there's a second game, but I doubt there will be. Right. So you can take those three off. There is actually a Captain America Black Panther game being developed. Mm. I can't think of the studio off the top of my head. Right. There is Marvel Midnight Suns releasing in about a month. Actually, oh, yeah. about a month and a half. I do remember that game. So you can take that team off. Mm-hmm. Iron Man right here. Right. So I think the only ones that really could be left are, like you say, Thor. Mm-hmm. And the one that I want to put out there is Daredevil. That would be interesting because Daredevil has only recently been getting traction yeah. with the, the She-Hulk series. And even then, it's just kind of like a budding resurgence, if that makes sense. It's a resurgence. And I think that Marvel noticed, obviously, that there was that love and support there from his Netflix show. Right. So they brought him back. And Absolutely. they're not just bringing him back as cameos. They are giving him Daredevil Born Again, the series, which is a big deal, having his – bringing him back from the dead, born <laughs> born again. And I think a game to go alongside of that would make sense. Yeah, that would definitely be smart. It's like people start hyping for that you know, Daredevil content, and then the game would just be the icing on the cake. I think so. I think – Black Panther would be a safe bet, but they're kind of, they're doing that already. Obviously, Captain America would be a safe bet. They're doing that. The only other game that I could think of would maybe be a, um, a Captain Marvel game or... Even just Captain America. I mean, like you said before, it could be with Black Panther, but um, maybe just a more fleshed out... Yeah, maybe a more fleshed out with Captain America. I mean, they're, those are the big three. Right. You got Iron Man, Captain America, and Thor. Mm-hmm. I could totally see them doing a Hulk game, but I feel like Hulk's popularity has been slowly on the decline in the last, mm-hmm. you know, decade. Right. And then they've had a handful of Hulk games in the past anyway, so it's not yes. like they need to make another Hulk game just for the sake of trying to bring it back. Let's go to number two. PlayStation trying to bring back their subscribers. Is PlayStation in trouble? Oof. As I, reported by Push Square, Sony has lost 1.9 million PlayStation Plus subscribers in the past three months. Its Q2 physical year 2022 financial results reveal it means the service's member count drops to 45.4 million, down from 47.3 million in the previous quarter. This is the first full quarter since PlayStation Plus underwent a revamp and introduced two new tiers in PlayStation Plus Extra and PlayStation Plus Premium. Sony's network services actually recorded a 10% increase in revenue. It could suggest that while there are fewer members, enough subscribers have upgraded to a higher tier to offset the loss from those who left it. Reason I put this in there is because you are a recent PlayStation Plus subscriber. Yeah, actually, you know, this is really interesting. I can see um, between before with the PlayStation Plus just being a flat service to this upgrade, I can see why 
there's such a big spike for two main reasons. One is kind of going back to the 10% increase in revenue. They did um, make some things higher. So obviously people are like not justifying the purchase of the higher tiers or just even the base price. Uh, I'm not sure what the relation is to base tier and original, but I know the other two are obviously an increase. Um, the second thing, and this kind of goes to the premium, like the highest tier. Um, one of the main concerns is just that there's not enough content of, you know, the vintage catalog to justify making that leap to premium. The classic catalog is malnourished. Exactly. For what they're offering in price, there should be far more with what they're currently offering. 100%. Each month since the PlayStation Plus Premium has launched with that classic tier, Mm -hmm. they have had, I want to say, two or three maybe new PlayStation 1 games released to that classic catalog in the last six or seven months. Yeah, and the quality of them, they're like average, but not, you know, wow factor. Like, I need to go get a premium just to play those games. I wanted to actually test this. So about a month ago, I upgraded from the PlayStation Plus Extra tier, which I believe is the most lucrative for the consumer. I upgraded to the PlayStation Plus Premium tier Mm. to test out the streaming. Yeah. I actually was a subscriber to PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now probably for the last two years. And I like streaming games on PlayStation now here and there. I definitely didn't use it enough to justify paying for it. Yeah. So I wanted to upgrade to PlayStation plus premium to try it out, see if they improved anything. And it is worse than PlayStation. Now, not necessarily the streaming quality, even though the streaming quality is terrible. It is the lack of content. For an example, one of my favorite games Sonic Adventure 2 mm-hmm. used to be streamable on PlayStation Now. Yeah. Is not even available on PlayStation Plus Premium. Yeah. And that's a real shame that a bunch of stuff that we're on now just kind of got axed and whatever was left over made its way through, but in such a fine selection. A ve- there was more of a selection before. Right. They revamp it, upgrade it. Increase the price, mm-hmm. and there's now less games. Yeah, so that doesn't really make sense from a consumer standpoint. You're going to offer less and charge more. Going straight into number three, here's where I think the value will come from. HBO's The Last of Us listed for January 15th premiere date. Oh. I think that they are going to implement that... Um, video pass the there's a what is it called the playstation i think it's the playstation video pass that's the first i'm hearing of it to be yes honest. it it launched in europe i forget what country the video pass was included in the playstation plus membership and it included all of the sony movies except for spider-man oh by marvel it actually included i want to say the venom movies uncharted i think it did uncharted and i think bloodshot while also having the transmedia adaptations from PlayStation, such as Uncharted, the movie. Mm -hmm. They're coming out with a Horizon series. Oh. Uh, Like I just said, The Last of Us series that's coming out January 15th. Of course, it's coming to HBO. But that's something that you could see potentially being wrapped into that video pass coming to PlayStation Plus, which has been announced to coming to the u.s at some point in the future okay so it's on its way then i think the transmedia properties and adaptations are going to be where that value is added not necessarily classic games i think that this shift has to be a quality high enough to justify the investment Or it's just going to be, you know, a flop in terms of execution. High quality studio, Rocksteady. Ooh. Some trouble going on behind the scenes for that studio. Sefton Hill, the founder of the studio, Mm -hmm. has left. Oh. That is usually never a good sign. No. 
This studio, Rocksteady, is responsible for some of the greatest video games, uh, pop culture comic book video games ever made. Arkham Asylum, Arkham City, Mm -hmm. Arkham Knight. They have a game, The Suicide Squad, set to release in 2023. Here's the problem. The game isn't out yet, and they have the founder of the studio and I believe the co-founder, both, leaving the studio. Yeah. Now, was there anything recent that came out um, just within like the past year or two? They have not had a release since 2015. Wow. Now, there's a lot of issues behind the scenes at Warner Brothers that I believe was affecting the release schedule of these mm-hmm. games, which is one of the reasons Gotham Knights came out in such a bad state. Yeah, that's a real shame. It looked promising, but just came out, you know, less so. Yes, and I feel like that quality dip is because of the studio quality, the the, the devs. Not all studios are equal. Like I was saying, Rocksteady is an acclaimed studio. They have They have a lot mm-hmm. of talent and a lot of proven success and sales under their belt. However, the reception from the trailer and, you know, all the reactions from the co- the content from the Suicide Squad so far has not been on par with their previous games. Them leaving, turmoil behind the scenes at Warner Brothers only reinforces the idea that the studio is not where it should be behind the scenes. And that's just sad to see from a, a great studio like Rocksteady. I just wish they would still come out with the quality of games that they did 10 years ago. Yeah, years and it's ago. a real shame that you see something that has such a history to it, you know, you know, struggle to keep its former glory. And one of the things I will say is that even though the games, you know, like Suicide Squad, it hasn't been out yet. Most of the time, these fallouts make the game suffer, but there's a chance that if the game is really good enough, it could swing things in the opposite direction. You know, maybe keep the you know the crumbling foundation from falling apart, um, at least for a little bit longer. Yes, and I will say that this is very far along in the game's development. It is set to come out without delays, and they announced that they won't be leaving until the end of the year, so you can assume they're leaving on good terms. Mm-hmm. I think, like you said, that you know they are successful and leaving, they can start another studio. They can do whatever they want and be successful in another vein outside of Warner Brothers. Yeah. And us being you know, pop culture fans, we love Batman. Mm-hmm, we love the Suicide Squad, all that stuff. Give us more. But we don't want Avengers quality. Yeah. We want Arkham quality. Yeah, like, especially Arkham versus Gotham. Like, that's the biggest comparison. We want, we can end it with this. We want Arkham Knight quality, not Gotham Knight quality. Amen to that. That's a good way to put it. Topics of the show. High, high quality year this year for all things pop culture. Oh, I agree. 100%. There's still a big year ahead for films in an already extremely packed year with all kinds of pop culture hits. The Suicide Squad movie by James Gunn, Multiverse of Madness by Sam Raimi, Black Adam with The Rock, Jurassic World Dominion, Top Gun Maverick, The Batman. These are all very, very, very high quality movies that came out this year. Yeah, and I will say it's interesting because the Suicide Squad actually branched out and they made like a pacemaker series with, you know, yes. John Cena. It was that much of an impact. And the Batman's branching out. They're making a Penguin series with uh, Colin Farrell. Oh. Also directed by Matt Reeves. That is a, you know, a unique thing to note i didn't know about the penguin spinoff yes and i believe it will be an hbo series supposed okay. to come out next year all right yeah i that's believe something to keep my eyes you know focused on more series came out this year like kenobi mm. 
was huge for Star Wars. Oh yeah, no doubt. I mean that Kenobi kind of bridged the gap between three yes. and four. It it bridged the gap between fans of the series and the lost fans of the series. That too, yeah. I felt like they made a lot of, you know, visual directions that gave the series a chance to redeem itself. There's also better stuff out there than mm-hmm. Kenobi. Yes. I there there has been better content this year <laughs> than Star Wars content. And that specifically is Cobra Kai. Okay. I I'm I'm gonna let you talk more about that. I've seen like the first season into the second. Um I never got a chance to watch the rest of the season, so I'll let you touch up on that. Cobra Kai is doing what Star Wars wishes it could do. And I'm not exaggerating. Cobra Kai, another you know branch from a movie series, mm-hmm. Karate Kid from the 80s. Yep. Very similar to Star Wars. Of course, Star Wars is one of the most synony- synonymous IP with pop culture in the world. Absolutely. But that hasn't been the case in recent years. Kenobi wasn't even able to bring it back as much as Cobra Kai brought back love and respect and the views for that series because it respected the old characters and it wasn't a new story for old characters. It was a continuation of the story from 25 years ago. Yeah, I will say Star Wars. Ago. Yeah, Star Wars has had a lot of jumps in narration direction because of different directors and different um themes that they went for but cobra kai just like you said just stuck to what it did and then made an epilogue so to speak and that epilogue is its own series with following seasons a few other seasons this year stranger things season four. Oh, yeah uh that overall yeah overall great. i love stranger things i don't think i'm too familiar with season four though in relation to like the other ones also, The Boys, season Bo- three. Yes, Boys. I know, I actually watched that religiously. That one I'm more invested in. We will save that for another time. All right. Because there's still more coming this year, mm-hmm. as in Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. Wakanda Forever. My thoughts on that? Mm-hmm. It's going to be better than the first one. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting. It's going to I- respect the legacy of Chadwick. Right, and this is going to be the movie that explains why he's not present. Like, they kind of just do this jump, but this is the movie that explains that jump. And we've all, as fans, just of comics and and Marvel and all of that, have been waiting for how they're going to respond to this. Mm -hmm. Not because we want to see them cover the fact, but we want to see them respect what he has done. Yeah. And this is why you see a movie and first you think, okay, they're just pandering off of, you know, the series without him. But the fact that they do like an, like, I guess an honorable mention slash, um, what I'm thinking of is like a, like a memorable homage. I guess the best they're going to, they're going to pay homage. Yeah, that's the best thing. Like, they're going to show this is what the series is going to be, but we wouldn't have been able to do it without them. Yes, and that is that is one of the most exciting things about this movie, along with Namor. Yeah. Huge comic book character. What do they call him? The Feather God on his feet. He actually flies with, with those. Yeah, like, it, you know, before, you know, like, going back a bit to Captain America, the first soldier, like, they have... When they have him in his like advertising phase, they have him in his comic book outfit, and you kind of just look at it and be yes. like, "Man, they're just paying a little Easter egg to you know what they had before." But here, it's like actually being functional and implemented properly. And comic accurate suits are one of the best things you can do for the fan base and to get people really invested in the movie. And a movie that does that better than almost any comic book movie is Shazam. Shazam. They have the whole family, the whole Shazam family looking like they have ripped them directly out of the pages of a Shazam comic. 
Yeah, and it's interesting that um, at least with the DC side of things, they take a more, I guess, parallel transition from comic to movie versus Marvel, where they take more liberty in how they want to do certain things. And Shazam! Fury of the Gods comes out later this year, about two months after Black Adam. Okay. I saw Black Adam... We're going to probably have a spoiler-type episode for it in the coming weeks. Absolutely amazing movie. He was extremely comic accurate. They switched up his origin a little bit, Mm -hmm. and I love what they did with his origin. Sure. Made a lot of sense. It Somehow, The Rock was acting great in it, and it really resonated. I think – I mean, with it resonated with me, but I think – when you watch it, you're going to be able to relate to his character. Yeah, and I've seen a few trailers, but you could see that his character is like more neutral. I mean, they don't want it to just be like he's a hero or he's a villain. Yes. You're kind of left to guess, be like, what's going on in his mind, and what is his main like motive for like you know choosing this or that. Exactly. He's not the typical anti-hero. He he's is, almost like flipping a coin. It's like, you're going to either have it in your favor or not. And it's, the way he does it is very, it's realistic. I mean, you watch the movie and of course it's The Rock flying around in black tights, but the way they manage to get across the message, and, and I'm trying not to spoil it, but... oh yeah. Like I was talking about earlier with Far Cry, it is a story, Black Adam is a story about revolution. Yeah. About rebelling. And sometimes it takes more than a hero to do the make the hard choices. Yeah, and that makes sense. Like Suicide Squad has been like an underdog type of thing. Like you sometimes have to get dirty to get the things needed done. Exactly. Last for the year is Avatar, The Way of Water. I'm not sure if you're an Avatar fan or not. I mean, I definitely was really hyped for the first one, but because it's been so long since, you it's know, been then so and long. now, I'm not as like invested in it. And is this going to be like full 3D, like the original Avatar? Yes, the I will say the animation or well, the CG in the See, movie looks amazing. That's interesting. Um. Yeah, like I said, it's been a while, so I can't really say, oh my god, it's finally here, because it's been that long, and I've kind of grown out of it. If they would have done this, like, maybe five years ago, I feel like that would have been enough to really... And they're making four of these. Four? Wow. One every Christmas for the next four years. So they must have been in development, working yes. on this behind they're the They're wrapping scenes. up the fourth one as we speak. Wow. Crazy. So that's a lot of content in the oh, coming absolutely. years. That's it's been a lot of packed, you know. There's so much going on this year, and it's like there's still a lot just for the last two months. And there's a, another behemoth of a year, just about a month or two away. So I got a question for you. I got okay. a few questions for you. Yeah. Is pop culture content at an all time high right now? Uh, I guess you would have to ask what you refer to as an all-time high. Okay, that come, that brings me to my other question. Are we experiencing an oversaturation of content with just the illusion of it being high quality? It's Personally, I feel like it's somewhere in the middle. Like It's kind of both. Yes, there are really successful hits like throughout the year, but at the same time, it's almost like they were just chucking darts blindly at a dartboard and the ones that landed landed and the ones that didn't just kind of faded out. I mean, like, you know, more, yeah, was it Morbius? Yes. <laughs> just kind of like that itself is just a thing that everyone talks about. Like it originally made it seem like the joke of like, Oh my God, this is the funniest thing ever just because of it's that bad. But then, no, I'm kind of getting back on track. It's just so much content they threw out there. They were kind of almost doing like Hail Mary, like one of these is going to land or a few handful of these in particular. Exactly. I think it's indisputable that there is more 
pop culture content now than there has ever been. And in part, that's due to Marvel with 18 shows and 15 movies a year. Yep, that definitely was a big factor. And I think that creates the illusion of high quality content. But there are so many high quality performances and shows and movies with even within the Marvel, you know, throw it at the wall and see what sticks. Well, even just stuff like Netflix, Hulu, Peacock, and those exactly. streaming services, they've done similar stuff, just like um I can't even think of anything in particular off the well, top like of my Prey head. on Hulu. That's a Predator kind of prequel. Oh. And Prey, it just it was fantastic. It was one of the best movies of the year. And it was a Hulu release. And it was it was Hulu's biggest, you know, movie release ever, I believe. <laughs> and that's it's still something. Yeah, and that's that's saying something, but it was actually good content. And of course, we got movies, in my opinion, like the Batman, Suicide Squad, uh, Top Gun, oh, Top Gun. All of those actual high quality content. Uh, even though I think there is also an oversaturation. And part of it kind of is um, with Top Gun in particular, like they kind of did that hail mary type of thing with let's bring something old back and see if people take the bait. And it just ended up working really well, but it was still that gamble of relying on older IP to get people interested. So that brings me to the very last topic of the show. With all of the games coming out this year and the oversaturation of content, this year we're experiencing so many games that were supposed to come out in the last two years, but got delayed from COVID. Right. There is uh, just, a, it's like a bundle of games coming out. Oh, I know. It's all ridiculous. at once. There's so many. We can get into them. But ultimately, my question is before we end this, what does this mean for Game of the Year 2022? Mm. Well, we can debate. We can sure. list out off all of the games. We got Modern Warfare 2, God of War Ragnarok, Pokemon, Sonic, even though Sonic will never win. <laughs> Callisto Protocol is coming out. We had Elden Ring earlier this year. Horizon Forbidden West, Plague Tale Requiem, Gran Turismo. I mean, I could keep going. There's so many. I mean, that's just – this was like some of it were a little bit in the beginning and just kind of – sprinkled itself out throughout the year um so narrow it down what are you looking for in game of the year the game of the year really should be something that hits as many strides as possible i mean we're talking like stories of really big when people want to have something that they can invest into and just resonate with what's going on i'd say another thing is presentation like Obviously, games are going to have bugs here and there, but you want something that's ultimately going to be near perfect as it's you know released and presented. And then finally, I would say to a degree, replayability even, or I guess continued um, playthrough after initial completion, just because a good game of the year offers something that you want to go back into not because you have to, but because you want to. So that brings me to a thought that I had. Okay. Will Elden Ring be dethroned for game of the year? Because we that, all know it. It's most likely going to be Elden Ring. It's very promising. Like you got to consider from software. Um, I know you've mentioned before, maybe not, you know, on the podcast, but outside of this, that you're not an entirely big fan of Elden Ring, just like the Dark Souls S theme, but that's part of why it's so good is that it takes the you know the original Dark Souls content and makes it open world, and that changes so many different things. Even what they offer in terms of combat and items and just exploration um, back then they enhance it and make it even more, I guess, 
expansive, something that you can really put thousands of hours in if you really wanted to and maybe only scratch a portion of it. And I think that actually stands out in a year like this Mm -hmm. coming out of, you know, the, the COVID delays. Yeah. I was not a fan at all. I, but I think it'll be game of the year. It, it's not my personal game of the year. Right, and that's unfortunately the way it is. It's that a game of the year may not be for everyone. You might have a game of the year and you used to be like, why would they pick that? But you have to take a look and see what they offer versus every other game that's in contest, you know, I guess competition for it. And then they even and have I, subcategories as well, like different games having, a, like, you know, I guess best uh, multiplayer experience or something like that, where you could like what was the year twenty sixteen? Mm-hmm. I think um, Overwatch won Game of the Year. Yeah, something like that, where it was definitely a good experience, but I felt like there probably were other games that should have hit Game of the Year just because um, I did mention like replayability, but I felt like it's more of a live service game; it shouldn't quite be in that category even so though- i think elden ring kind of ameliorates those issues that you're specifically saying about that game as a live service i think elden ring has a, a very similar qualities to it in terms of replayability with story with difficulty with multiplayer it has had all year to you know be played unlike I think one of the strongest contenders this year, God of War, that comes out in two weeks, mm-hmm. it won't have the as much time, you know, in the spotlight. But that's I feel as if that could be, you know, something that the God of War game compared to, you know, the original, I guess, what was it, twenty eighteen or nineteen? Twenty eighteen. Okay, twenty eighteen version that came out. Um it really is in comparison to what's everything else. Like if everything else doesn't, you know, compare to God of War, then God of War is going to win. But because Elden Ring came out and there's such a huge fan base for it, most people know, like most people have played Dark Souls at least one point in their life. And even though God of War has, you know, history behind it, they've only recently changed their direction. You know, like they went from just mindless arcade violence to a more grounded experience. And it definitely is for the better, but they are competing with Elden Ring. And that's kind of what makes this whole thing, you know, harder to say what's what going to be better, especially since yeah, it's only been out for a, a, will be out for a bit. A reboot for the series. It was so different than the old games, which were those hack and slash games yeah god of war ragnarok is already being negatively received even though a lot of people haven't even played it because it looks so similar to the 2018 game whereas elden ring is a completely new concept for FromSoft, and not only is it a new concept for the souls games they knocked it out of the park. Yeah. So I think the perception here is really what is going to be the difference for game of the year. And that kind of is going back to the whole, like what you said about how the Ragnarok looks so similar to the 2018 God of War. But I yes. think that's just because they, at least with the way 2018 God of War was perceived and how it was reviewed, it was near perfect and they're just keeping true to that. It's like the saying, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. Elden ring is that big jump. And the perception is that it is like the perception was for God of war 2018 near perfect. Yeah. And that's just the thing about that is people have this hype and expectation. When they see something, they expect anything else to either match it or be better. Yes. And the the sad truth is just that that's not possible with a game. You're going to have some stuff that 
has its strides, some stuff that is could use improvement. But at the end of the day, if nothing can be fundamentally changed to make it better, then the best that it could do is match the previous scores. It can't get better. Because the perception. And it goes back to, what are you doing for me right now? If God yeah. of War comes out and it reaches the hype levels and like you're saying, exceeding those expectations, then that perception is going to make it seem like game of the year because it is going to overshadow Elden Ring. And maybe that might happen because of the time between the games. I mean, it has been a while since we've all really been into Elden Ring because it came out in February. Yeah, it's been some time. A lot of games choose to come out at the beginning of November because that is peak time for game of the year contenders. You're fresh on people's mind going into the next year. Yeah, when, that and just um, holidays is a big one. It influence, you know, something to get the family as Christmas comes up is one of the It's going to influence the perception of the game. Hey, this is the holiday game. Yeah. You know, February. Horizon Forbidden West came out in February. Yeah. I think um, Gran Turismo came out in March. It's Nothing is happening that time of year. You're not thinking, hey, this is the February game. Games used to never come out in January and February. Yeah. It really it wasn't until the Switch came out. This is a whole other subject, but <laughs> the Switch kind of created that springtime or early year, you know, February, March, April, you know, time frame for games because everything used to come out towards the end of the year for that reason. It is, this is the holiday game. You get Modern Warfare to play with your friends during the holiday. Yeah. And I think part of it is just that the earlier releases are mainly filler just because it's unused um, revenue, not revenue, but it's unused time frame that people are waiting for that October, November game release. This there's is no kind more. Of, there's no competition in that time. Exactly. Of year. So if you yeah. release something in February or March, even that's a game that people can play while they wait for stuff that comes out later on in the year. And it's going to be interesting to see the game of the year. We're going to see very shortly how all of this pans out for 2022. Yeah, and I admit that there is, you know, such a polarizing opinion on different aspects of pop culture. People have, you know, groups that see things in rose-tinted glasses, and they're just like, this is perfection. Anything that messes with it is, is bad or wrong. And then you have the other side that's open to change. And as long as they keep true to whatever they're working on, they can at least take that as a step in the right direction. But going back into the whole good and bad of pop culture, it's a lot to go through. And if honestly, we could just do numerous channels or I guess numerous episodes just going through all of pop culture in this year alone. But until then, I have been Caleb Johnson. You can find me at General J five O first on Twitter, or join the Senate Discord. Anything else you want to say, Mister Tate Smith? Um, you know, the only thing I could really say is I look forward to joining in the next episode and seeing where we take things from there. I'll try to make it a good one. So until then. See you guys later. Yeah, catch you later.